Good morning, beloveds. It is so good to see you here. I am the Reverend Justine Sullivan, one of the ministers here at First UU of San Diego. This is a very special day for us. We have um, a number of um, special visitors and the woman behind me, some of you might recognize, I will introduce her in a moment. Um, but Susan has been here this weekend meeting with the President's Council, um, a group of advisors, kind of like a committee on ministry for the UUA president, uh, helping to um, help her connect with congregations and helping with big projects. Um, Reverend Omega and I had a chance to be with, with some of them yesterday and that was lovely. Um, so it's just so good to have you here and I'm going to name a few of you and I'm sorry I'm going to forget some of you but um, I want to warn people that um, the Director of Stewardship and Development, Lauren Smith, <laughs> and the Director of Congregational Giving, Val Weller, are both in the house. So, um, yes. And our Executive Vice President, Carrie McDonald, is here also. It's wonderful to have you here, Carrie. And so many other UU luminaries, luminary being spelled with two U's, luminaries. It's just so good to be together. And I know that this is the first time that this group has met in person in a while, so it's been good for you all to be in each other's presence. Um, and there's another person I want to introduce. She actually is part of this community, uh, but when we think about the shoulders that we stand on as we move forward together, the Reverend Carolyn Owen Toll, Minister Emerita here. Carolyn ran for UUA president in 1993, and she almost won. <laughs> Only the second woman to run for that office. But her result showed us that a woman could run for high office credibly and could win. And today, I have the deep honor of welcoming to our chancel the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, first woman elected as president of our UUA. Good morning, First UU San Diego. It is my great joy to be with you this morning. You all are so close to my heart. I come to this campus. It, there are aspects of it that feel like home. Dear colleagues, friends here in the gathered community, when I ministered for nine years at the UU Congregation of Phoenix, Arizona, not that far away, I had many opportunities to be welcomed into your community, whether it was for a district gathering or a professional gathering. You all have hosted and opened your doors and your campus to so much leadership and formation of our faith from this campus. And it is good to be with you. It is good to see you. It is good to connect to those who are online. It is good to be together. I'm excited to be here as you are about to celebrate your 150th anniversary. So I'm here as a little bit of a kickoff to that celebration. And I want to give you all a hand for a moment because yes, our Director of Stewardship and Development is here and yes, our Director of Congregational Giving is here. The Reverend Lauren Smith is Director of Stewardship. The Reverend Vale Weller is Director of Congregational Giving. But you all have been an honor congregation giving your full requested amount to the UUA for decades and decades and decades. So I want to give you a 
my hand. Your faithful support makes it possible for the UUA to support congregations in transition like your congregation is in this time of transition, but it also allows us to support your sibling UU congregations all across the association. And I want you to know that your generosity means that you are making a difference in the lives of congregations that you will never visit and in the lives of Unitarian Universalists, many who you will never meet. Because someone on UUA staff, someone in our regional office, someone in our credentialing department, someone was there in a congregation's time of need. And your faithful, generous, consistent support makes that possible. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your generosity. And I want you to know that when I was minister in Phoenix, they were inspired by your generosity. And you all set a culture in the Pacific Southwest District of generosity. You all have consistently been a leader and an inspiration to those across the region and across our UUA. It makes such a difference. Thank you. I invite you to take a deep breath. Let's center in for worship. The words for our call to worship are from the Indian poet of the fifth, fifth century, Kalidasa. Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the truths and realities of existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision, but today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day and the gift of this day. Well, good morning, San Diego. What a beautiful day indeed. I'm the Reverend Omega Burkhart, the assistant minister here, and my pronouns are she, they, y ella, en español. I'd like to extend a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the very first time. Also a welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time in perhaps a very long time. We bid you welcome also to the folks who are joining online and to those who are outside on the patio. Good morning to you. Nuestra comunidad es una congregación vital, diversa, multigeneracional y sin fronteras, cuya misión es crear comunidad, fomentar el crecimiento espiritual y vivir nuestros valores para ayudar a sanar el mundo. We are a congregation made up of people of different racialized identities and cultures. People of various sexual orientations and gender identities. People with a variety of physical and mental abilities. Somos nosotros, somos creadores de comunidad y compasión. Y aunque a veces nos quedamos cortos, estamos comprometidos a dar la bienvenida a todos. In a spirit of reverence this morning, we acknowledge that we gather to reflect and sing and learn and convene on the stolen land of the Kumeyaay, who continue to pray and sing and gather and live throughout their territories. As we journey together this morning, may we hold the Kumeyaay in our hearts and minds. 
Con espíritu de reverencia esta mañana reconocemos que nos juntamos en la tierra arrebatada de los Kumiai, quienes continúan reuniéndose, cantando, viviendo en todo su territorio. Al emprender este viaje juntos esta mañana, mantengamos en nuestros corazones y mentes el pueblo Kumiai. At this moment, we invite you to rise in body or spirit and join us in singing our church hymn. The words can be found in your order of service or on the screen. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning, Tony. My name is Tony. I use he, him pronouns, and I would like to invite any of the children or youth and Reverend Susan to join me on the steps of the chancel for our time for all ages. Thank you. Friends, are you coming down with us this morning? Come on down. Oh, everybody's being shy this morning. Everybody's being shy this morning. Oh, Esther's here. Hello, welcome. How are you doing? It's good to see you. So, one of the things, oh, let's wait, we have some more visitors coming. Here we go. Hi, friends. Hey, good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Do you want to sit in here? You can sit in between us if you want. Good morning. Hi, welcome. Good morning. How you doing? So, you may have noticed our artwork up here. We talked about your coming last week. Yeah. And both the children and the youth group made our artwork. And they also brainstormed some questions that they would like to ask Reverend Susan. And I know that one thing that we love as you use is our, our acronyms and alphabet soups. So I'm calling this an R-E-Q-N-A-T-F-A-A -A with S-F-G. <laughs> And I have to say, too, before I ask the questions, I was super impressed with the level of questions from our children and our youth. So here they go. So the first question they wanted to know is, what made you decide to run to be the UUA president? Hmm, what a good question. Um, well, as, first off, as a faith leader, as a minister, I served a UU congregation for uh, a couple of congregations for a number of years, and I really did feel called um, in my heart. I felt like I had gifts that could help our association grow and develop in new ways, and um, 
this, this uh, faith, Unitarian Universalism, means, means so much to me, and I was, felt called to give back. Nice. So once you decided to run, how, how does that process work? How did you become the president? So there is, a, there is an election. So there were three candidates running um, for UUA president. All three were women, and so we knew we were gonna have our first elected woman president. And then delegates from all of our congregations, and there are over 1,000 Unitarian Universalist congregations across our association, delegates from all of our congregations voted. And um, through that process, I was elected. Nice. So it's a democratic process, it is. as one might guess from our principles. Yes, kind of exactly. Cool. Uh, so they also wanted to know, what are some of the main things you do as UUA president? Mm. Well, I do, I will, let me tell you my favorite thing to do. <laughs> my favorite thing to do is actually to visit our congregations and to be with our communities and to meet all of you and to see all of you. This gives me joy and inspiration for my work. I also... Uh, you know, do a lot of national speaking for our faith. I do a lot of writing. I uh, work closely with folks managing budgets, hiring staff. We have 200 staff who work for the UUA and they live all over the country. Um, so that's a big part of my job. During the pandemic, uh, we also did some, uh, we issued guidance and, um, to help our congregations keep one another safe. That was really important in this presidency. Ooh, that's a lot. It's a very important job, too. So they, want, they wondered what are some of the biggest changes or maybe the biggest change you've seen while you've been president? Well, I am really proud of the work that we have done to nurture a, a, a community and a staff culture where all people of all identities can thrive. We've done a lot of work on dismantling white supremacy culture in terms of how we operate, like making things more open, inclusive, just, and equitable. Um, so that's been a huge thing. We've had a lot of staff uh, join the UUA in this time. That's a big change. And then, you know, the same kind of changes that you all have been experiencing in terms of working virtually, going to school virtually, um, not having church in person for so long. I mean, big changes are the pandemic, um, the climate impacts we all experience um, and are learning to adapt in. Those have been some of the big world changes. And the work to protect democracy and defend democracy, right? And respond out of our faith values against authoritarianism and, um, uh, authoritarianism and, and really, you know, damaging policy, hateful rhetoric. So a little background, the children have just learned that there is a Canadian conference because I just learned that at the Laredo conference <laughs> in Alabama. So they wondered what's your relationship with the, the Canadian conference and they also wondered is there a conference of UUA in, Me or a UUA in Mexico? Oh, well, those are good questions, and I want to, I, I know our international director, the UUA actually has an international director office, and Reverend Alicia Ford, I believe, is here. Um, so there's Alicia, hi, Alicia, who runs our international office. So we do a lot of partnership work with the Canadian Unitarian Council, and one of the places we partner is with the UU office at the United Nations. Um, but there isn't, and I'm also, I talk with the, their leader, um, the, their, um, their um, I'm not sure if her term is president, but um, her name is Vida Ng, and we talk um, quite frequently. And then there isn't a, a, a separate like association of congregations in Mexico, but there are congregations in Mexico, UU congregations, that are a part of the UUA. There are also congregations in the Philippines that are part of the UUA. Um, but there is also um, a Hungarian Unitarian Council, and there is um, a British Unitarian group, um, and the Kasi Hills in Unitarians in India that are organized in the Kasi Hills region. So there are Unitarian Universalists all over. Fascinating. That's very interesting. Some of that Great I didn't question. know. So here come the hard-hitting questions. So. 
there, there was, I think, a, a sentence in, in our discussion last week where I said Susan Frederick Gray about 15 times in the same sentence. So they, they really want to know, why do you have two last names? Ah, great question. So when I, my name when I was your age, all of your ages, was Susan Gray. That was my name um, that my parents gave me, and my parents have the last name Gray. But then I married um, a person whose name is Brian Frederick, and we, just, we thought, what do we want our name to be? What do we want our last name to be? And we decided we wanted to combine our last names and be the Frederick Grays. We each wanted to honor both of our families as we got married. And so my husband, my son, and I are all Frederick Grays, and we are the only three Frederick Grays in the whole world. Whoa. <laughs> I went from having a very plain name, Susan Gray, to uh, a mouthful, longer name, Susan Frederick Gray. And our, our last question is maybe a little aspirational. They are wondering if you plan to run for president of the White House. <laughs> yes. Well, not tomorrow. <laughs> Well, if you change your mind... But you, I, appreciate the, I appreciate the encouragement. You, you have their vote, for sure. So, friends, thank you for such great questions, and thank you for such great answers. And I will invite us all to stand up. And if my children and youth would help me lead the congregation in our affirmation, we'll say it first in, in English and then in Spanish. All right, friends, you ready? Got your hands ready? We are Unitarian Universalists, a people of open minds, loving, loving hearts, hearts, and welcoming hands. Somos unitarios universalistas, personas de mentes abiertas, corazones amorosos, y manos que dan la bienvenida. And I invite any of the children and youth who would like to, to join me and their leaders on the patio for religious education. Would it be too presumptuous to just slide your name in for candidacy for the presidency? <laughs> As always, you are invited after the service today to speak with one of our trained lay pastoral ministers. I believe Lisa Thurn is with us today wearing a colorful silk scarf. If you would like to speak with someone after, you can find her outside on the patio. De colores, de colores se visten los campos en la primavera. That's okay, you don't have to play. <laughs> Although now you're all going to sing it in your heads, which is great. That's how we started our service yesterday morning at the South Bay, our second service of Gracias y Bendiciones, a multilingual, multi-religious, multi-generational service sin fronteras, designed to feed the spirits of those who help feed the bodies of others. I have the pleasure of spending most of my Saturdays there supporting the work of the food pantry, uh, the volunteers from this congregation, the community volunteers, and the guests. I have other jobs when I'm there. I'm a chaplain. I accompany folks when they need someone to speak with. I'm a great box breaker downer. <laughs> I've been known to carry a turkey or two. Sometimes I translate really whatever the moment calls for. And it has been one of the greatest gifts of my ministry here. As we move into our generosity offering today, I'd like you to recall esta congregación aspera vivir de acuerdo con nuestros principios de ayudar por apoyar y formar relaciones responsables con organizaciones locales que trabajan para apoyar el crecimiento, salvar vidas y honrar la dignidad humana. We aspire to save lives, to honor human dignity, and as we say in our words of welcome, to become and to celebrate 
the multicultural community we are, the multi-generational community we are without borders. If you are looking for an example, uh, one of many, an example of how First UU San Diego creates space for community engagement in creating systems of mutual care, mutual care that dismantles oppression, mutual care that serves both the spirit and the body, the food pantry is a place where that is happening. And I know Valerie Jaquist spoke last week and gave you some information I just want to highlight today. That every Saturday morning, over 20 volunteers from the community, folks who have been guests at our pantry or have heard about us from somewhere else, set up along with our church members to organize distribution for over 350 families every Saturday. Now a family, we count as four people. That's over a thousand people we serve on a Saturday morning. And that's not counting our diaper distribution that also happens on Sunday morning. I'd like to take this moment to invite you to watch a video, an interview with some of our community members who organize with us. In fact, you'll see in this video, Manny and his wife Letty Manuel, he was recognized last month by our board with an attitude of gratitude because we're so glad that we have our community partners with us. This video was filmed and narrated by our own Nina Douglas, one of our organizers from this church. Robert, how long have you been volunteering with the South Bay Food Pantry? Uh, I've been here for almost two months. Two months? Yeah, almost two months. Two months. And it's have been a, a really nice, nice to be here with all these people and, and sharing stories and everything. And, yeah. yeah. How, did, how did you hear about the pantry? Uh, there's a, I have a neighbor who comes and collect, collect food. And he told me that probably it would be nice to be a volunteer. So uh, once I came with this person and I asked if I can be a volunteer because uh, honestly, it's nice to help others. And that's why I became wow. a volunteer. Wow, thank you. Um, is there anything about the pantry that surprised you? Well, um, well everything is just really nice. It's, everything is... Um, there's a very good food and there's a complete pantry for for the whole family for one or two families they have everything you have vegetables you have fruit you have milk juice and a lot of groceries and also frozen food when they have it yeah and wow everything is is really good everything's really good wow. for everyone wow. yeah. We are so glad you found the pantry and really appreciate your work. Thank you no, so thank much, Thank you very Robert. much for accepting me. Oh. And thank you very much for uh, everything you have done for the community and uh, to have you here, having oh. you. We are the fortunate ones. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Letty and Manny, how long have you been volunteering at the pantry? And as I recall, it's been over a year and a half and I found out through Facebook. I, um, my friend told me she saw it being announced that they made a volunteers, Maureen had to place it, I believe. So I, I showed up and everybody was friendly. They had, they were open to suggestions that I had where things could be put in different ways. And they were flexible. They knew they, they, they were, where they worked like a team. So that was very nice to see. And then a few, Times after I came, I, I mentioned it to my husband, Manuel, and he also wanted to help, so he started about, I don't know, two months. I started about uh, maybe six months ago after I retired. I, I had yeah. something to do, so I, I said, let me, let me try it out, and I, I loved it here. The people are great. I mean, mm -hmm. They're all very polite and fun to work with. Which is, except one, one guy. I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And that's why I'm, I've been coming so far. Because
because uh, I also need something to do in the... <laughs> And I enjoy seeing the smiles on the people that come to get their food and they're very um, happy and always giving us a feeling of, they feel, but we feel appreciated through them and I know we're doing a good deed and uh, God returns all, all the good deeds and back to us. God is good. <laughs> and so um, we're planning to be here until we can. Hopefully you know, guys I know there's more people now, so that's a blessing to help with the volunteers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope some more people join to help. We are so fortunate to have you guys. I'm sorry? We are so fortunate that you are here and do so much. We're very happy to be here. Thank you. When we can. <laughs> The one person who was not introduced in that video is Jeff, the partner of Nina, who is also there every Saturday morning. Uh, you may be able to tell from that video that it is joyful. It's very hard work. It's physically demanding. It's emotionally and spiritually demanding. And it is joyful. It is joyful. I'm looking at some of the folks who volunteer there. It is a joy. It is a joy. You may donate here in the moment of generosity by using the dip jars that are located here in the meeting house, in the middle of the meeting house, outside on the patio. Of course, you can always donate online, first to usandiego.org, donations page. If you'd like some assistance, please raise your hand. Se puede donar aquí usando las máquinas, aquí adentro, afuera en el patio, o siempre se puede donar en el sitio web de nuestra iglesia. Y como siempre. Muchas gracias. Thank you always for your generosity. And muchas gracias. Uh, gratitude to Katie Boscoff for recommending this song about doing holy work together. Uh, please, as you're donating, as you're sitting in your seats, sing along uh, with us and with me. The stream sings it to the river, the river sings it to the sea, the sea sings it to the boat that carries you and me. Somos el barco, somos el mar, yo navego en Touches every land. Somos el barco. Somos el mar. Yo navego en ti. Tú navegas en ti. And with our hearts we chart the waters never sailed before. Somos el barco, somos el mar, yo navego en ti, tú navegas en ti.
sing it one more time, just you all. Somos el barco. Caminantes, no hay camino. Caminantes son tus huellas, el camino y nada más. Caminante, no hay camino. Se hace el camino al andar. Al andar se hace el camino y al volver la vista atrás se ve la senda que nunca se ha de volver a pisar. Caminante, no hay camino, sino estelas en la mar. It's my pleasure now to invite the Chalice Choir up to share with us a song, not about the courage it takes to, to show up in life's huge, big moments, but about the courage it takes just to get up every day and do the work of living.
Again, it is so good to be with you this morning to share in this worship. I really, I want to thank my dear colleague, your developmental minister, the Reverend Justine Sullivan, for her tremendous ministry here, for her gifts. I want you also to know that Justine and I work together on the UUA Board of Trustees, another way that you all support wider leadership. Thank you, Reverend Justine. And it has been a gift to work with your whole worship staff in this service. Uh, Reverend Omega Burkhart, so good to meet you and lead worship with you. Marshall Voigt, Tony, Tony Bianca, just a delight, your whole staff. It's been a wonderful, um, a wonderful time in preparation. Well, what a time we are in, <laughs> friends. Oof. For more than a year now, I have been describing this time, these times we are living in, as liminal times. Liminal means a time in between, when what has been is no longer, and what is ahead is still unclear. There are so many transitions moving through our lives and our world. The pandemic upended and continues to upend so much. So much in our world still needs to be imagined. We are in a moment of struggle for what the future looks like and will be like a future where people, where humanity can thrive, can adapt to the circumstances of our already changing climate. You all, first you, you, are also in a time of transition, of intentional developmental ministry. In fact, I think actually we're all becoming seasoned liminalists. <laughs> Right? That we are all learning out of necessity to live and adapt in the in-between. And as much as we may be weary of uncertainty, worn from the grief and the loss and the heartbreak of these last few years, so many loved ones in our own lives we have lost. Weary from the multiple crises in our world, even weary from the ways that our hearts have been broken by loved ones or by community. As much as we may be tired of being in this uncertainty, we remain in liminal times. And it's so important that we bring forward the gifts and the lessons that we have learned in this time because we remain and are in need of so much change. Now, in times of change and disruption, there is a very human tendency, a risk that fear and anxiety will dominate. And anxiety is something that so many of us know and have experienced at deeper levels. I've never experienced the kind of anxiety I have in the last few years. The fears about the future of our country, the fears about my safety, the safety of loved ones, of our community. Sometimes it feels like we're at an abyss, the edge of an abyss. And so in times like this, it's easy for people to want to cling to what has been. Cling to what is familiar out of that sense of fear. To cling to a status quo that never served the cause of human need nor the values of justice and equity. But here's the thing. We are Unitarian Universalists, right? We are a people of faith. We are a people of hope and possibility. And it is that faith that we need in this time to move us through fear and to help us live in a creative moment that is possible right now. 
When so much seems uncertain, it matters that we lean into what we most know to be true. That we lean into the life-saving message of our theology and the life-affirming practices of care and beloved community. So there's a story about transition times that I want to share with you this morning. It's from the late Danan Perry, a writer and humanitarian, and he uses the metaphor of a trapeze artist to describe the experience of living in transition times. This is from the parable of the trapeze from Perry's book called Warriors of the Heart. And I, I want to acknowledge before I share the story that there is this is a very ableist metaphor of swinging across trapeze. But one of the things in, in, in looking at this story that I've been learning about is the athleticism of blind aerialists and disabled acrobats whose art and grace invites the same metaphors as this story. Perry writes, most of the time, I spend my life hanging on for dear life to my trapeze bar of the moment. It carries me along at a certain steady rate of swing, and I have the feeling that I'm in control of my life. <laughs> but every once in a while, I see another trapeze bar swinging toward me. Each time it happens, I pray that I won't have to let go of my old bar completely before I grab the new one. But in my knowing place, I know that I must totally release my grasp on the old bar. And for some moment in time, I must hurtle across space before I can grab that next bar. <sighs> Each time, I am filled with terror. It doesn't matter that in all my previous hurdles across the void of unknowing, I have always made it. I am each time afraid that I will miss. I do it anyway. I do it anyway. Perhaps this is the essence of what the mystics call the faith experience. No guarantees, no net, no insurance policy, but you do it anyway because somehow to keep holding on to that old bar is no longer on the list of alternatives. So for an eternity that can last a microsecond or a thousand lifetimes, I soar across the void of the past is gone, the future is not yet here. It's called transition. And I have come to believe that this transition is the only place where real change, real growth occurs. I mean real change, he writes, not the pseudo change that only lasts until the next time my buttons get pushed, but real change. What a great metaphor. Danan Perry offers for our lives today. And a reminder that change, needed change, is possible and maybe only possible in transition times and when we are letting or when we are willing to let go. That that's what makes change possible. And I invite you in a you know, I invite you to think about aspects of transition that may be present in your own lives in your own hearts, in your community, to be mindful of those transitions or those bars you may see swinging towards you or one that you may need to let go of. And there are a couple powerful lessons, nuggets of wisdom in this story that are helpful as we navigate the transitions we are experiencing. First, as Perry says, as much as we want to stay holding on to our current bar until the next one is safely in our hands, it just doesn't work that way. We have to totally release our grasp on the old bar to take a leap of faith in order to grab that next bar that is not quite in reach. And this is not easy. I want to be clear. 
For in times of change, there is real tension between longing for what was, what we knew was stable, familiar, and meaningful, even if it wasn't that for everyone, and the opportunity to imagine something new, new forms, new practices, new possibilities in our lives. And this is so alive in our congregations. The pandemic completely upended so much of congregational life and how we gather. We have an opportunity in this moment not to go back, but to keep living into this transition time, to navigate what comes next. And I know it also, this, this reality brings tension in our communities. Some of us know we can't go back. Heck, we don't wanna go back. Right? And we know that something different is needed and we desperately want to know what comes next. While others of us long for what was. So it's human and normal to be attached to the way church was when we first came and the reasons it was meaningful to us then. That matters. And truthfully, I bet a lot of us live somewhere with both of those things happening at the same time a longing for what was, a grief and a missing of what was, but also an openness to what could be. Embracing the possibility and creativity of this liminal time, using it to really grow and learn to care and heal means being willing to stay in the unknown, to stay in the uncertainty, to keep our hearts and our hands open and not wish to grab too soon to that next bar and be ready to keep letting go of the old bar. Danan Perry ends his parable of the trapeze with this reflection. He says, I have a sneaking suspicion that the transition zone is the only real time and that the bars are illusions that we dream up to avoid the void where real change, real growth occurs for us. Yes, with all the pain and fear and feelings of being out of control that can but not necessarily accompany transitions, they are still the most alive, growth-filled, passionate, expansive moments in our lives. Transforming our need to grab that new bar means allowing ourselves to dwell in the only place where real change can happen. It can be terrifying. It can also be enlightening in the true sense of the word, hurtling through the void we may just learn to fly. Perry is speaking to the possibility and the hope that is present in embracing these times and not trying to move too quickly to what we think is going to offer stability and certainty. There is power in hanging out in between. There is power in getting comfortable with the uncertainty of our lives and our world. And as powerful and growth-filled and expansive as these times are, I don't mean to suggest that they are easy, as you all know deeply here at First UU. Sometimes we are forced into transitions we never wanted. Losses that we couldn't have imagined. Times when the bars we were grateful to be swinging on just simply disappeared. It can be terrifying and painful. It requires giving ourselves time to grieve. Grieving is a critical piece of letting go. Because with all change, there is loss. Even when there's opportunity, and recognizing loss and attending to that grief is important in moving through the transition. And that is why in community, in this time of uncertainty, I think what matters most is the care we give each other. What matters most is leaning into attention, listening, loving, caring relationship. There's two more gems in this story I want to lift up. One that the author doesn't mention, but it's so clear to me. When the trapeze artist lets go of that bar, they do not free fall. There is momentum carrying them as it carries all of us. 
what has been, what has nurtured us and been a source of strength and faith, it doesn't go away. It remains a source of strength, as does the calling of our faith and our values. These draw us forward still. And it's that fear of free fall that keeps us from letting go, clinging to something that can no longer be. But our shared connection, the strength of our ancestors, our rituals of song and poetry, our spiritual imagination, they are like a wind at our back and a propeller calling us forward. We give each other courage. We do not free fall. And then the second piece. While this story imagines a solo trapeze artist, I don't believe that any of us are swinging on these bars alone. We are on these bars together. We are in this world, in this community, in these times together. And that our sense of interconnection, interdependence, the ways we lean into the knowledge that we belong to each other can help us reach out to one another as we move forward in love. We have been in a liminal time for years now, a time in between what has been and what is not yet. And as much as we may want to find solidity again, and my hope is that, you know, I mean, truthfully, we're always in transition. I love that piece, the bars of the illusion, and there's solidity. There are moments of solidity, even in change. The relationship you're nurturing with Reverend Justine, a developmental ministry is a time of transition, and yet there's solidity and relationship and care in the midst of it. But I want to invite you to not want to get too comfortable, right? Because we are in this, we are in this time at a threshold moment, and we need religious communities that are willing to remain unsettled because so much is unsettled, right? We need to be people, courageous, risk-taking people that are willing to be in the struggle for the world that we need, a world that affirms the worth and dignity of every person, a world that cares for this natural earth as a gift and a source of our lives. To lean into and reimagine what prophetic, life-saving, and justice-making ministry can be. Knowing faithfully that our values, our vision, and each other carry us forward. Doing that, we may just learn to fly. Heaven knows where we are going, but we are going together. <laughs> I invite you to rise and body your spirit and sing those words with us, our hymn, Wo Ya Ya, as our chalice choir makes their way up.
Please remain standing in body or in spirit for our benediction. Spirit of life, faith of those who came before and dreamed before us, trust in those who will come after us. Love that is the motive force of our lives, web of life in which we are a part. In the midst of so many transitions in our lives and our world, may we feel the wind at our backs and the calling of our hearts rooted in our values of love and justice. Keep us true to that which we hold most dear, always calling us forward in love and liberation. Blessings on this gathered community, on each and every one of you, beautiful spirits, whole and wonderful, loving people. May you be blessed and blessings to your families and loved ones. May we all be held more deeply in love and in care for each other. Blessed be and amen. Singing, raised voices ringing, move forward. In.